For me, everything I did to do with the camera, to do with editing, was useful experience uh, and stuff that, that paid off uh, when I came to actually you know, make features. And really everything you do, you, you learn from in terms of any time you're shooting something, a short film, particularly short film when you try to write the script for a short film. It's very difficult to write a short film. I think in some ways it's harder than for a feature to have a complete idea in just a few minutes and have a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, have a, an appropriate conclusion. So you learn a lot about narrative structure doing shorter films. But really every job I did, including uh, you know, corporate videos and industrial training films and things where I'd have to go to a company and throw up some lights and shoot interviews you know, with executives and things like that, uh, you're always learning about your craft. You're always learning about uh, you know, how to balance the pragmatic requirements, the race against time, uh, using the equipment you've got in a short space of time to sort of get something that you can, you can use. It's all useful experience. When you're starting out particularly, you have to play to your strengths. You have to do something that really excites you and whatever's different about that. And in the case of following the, the non-linear structure was a, a, a somewhat unusual choice. Um, but it's those things that are the strength of the project. Uh, it's the things that you can bring to what you're doing or bring to the filmmaking craft that maybe not everybody else is doing, maybe not everybody else can do or is thought to do. That's what's gonna distinguish the thing. So it might seem in some ways more difficult or seem like something that would make the project more difficult to, to sell when it's finished, you know, what, what have you. But for me, I think the answer was definitely to try to play to my strengths and the things that I personally uh, was passionate about. I think working in, in films today it's an era where people tend to watch films more than once, even if they don't like them. You know, you'll see it in the cinema on its first release, perhaps, and then you'll see it on, you know, cable television or television. You'll watch it on an airplane or in a hotel room or something, uh, or it winds up eventually on on uh, regular TV. And so, I think my generation of filmmakers understood really there's a responsibility to try and make something that has layers, something that has more to it the second time you see it, or some different aspect to it. And I chose to take the path of incorporating that desire for, for a layered approach into the narrative itself, into the story, if you like. And so I've made films that have some ambiguity to them or some layering to them narratively, so that if you see them a second time, you're gonna watch them in a slightly different way. Uh, that, was, that was my approach. There are other filmmakers who approach it from a purely visual point of view, where they would just create very dense visuals that, that would sustain multiple viewings because you'd sort of see more in the frame. Well, Memento was based on a short story that my brother was writing. And he, he hadn't yet written it fully, but he described the idea to me. And I thought it would make an excellent film. And I asked him if I could uh, take the idea while he was writing his short story, whether I could take it and write a screenplay. Uh, from it, and thank goodness he, he agreed to that and let me do that. So he went off and wrote on the short story, and I think it took him almost as long as it took me to make the whole film <laughs> as it did to, to write the short story. And it's a, it's a very brilliant story uh, that was that was published in Esquire um, right when the film came out. Uh, and so it was an interesting collaboration um, because I had a lot of freedom to explore the idea that he'd given me. And then as I got into sort of screenplay form, then I would show it to him and talk about how I could improve it. And he was a, a huge help with, with that as well. So we, we had an excellent collaboration on it. It was very, uh, very important for both of us, I think. The original inspiration behind the, the Dark Knight trilogy, and particularly Batman Begins, uh, it was about taking this beloved character and recontextualizing the character, setting this extraordinary figure in an ordinary world or a seemingly ordinary world. And so for me, it was much more about creating a recognizably real scenario that the extraordinary figure of Batman could exist in and addressing the origins of that, the origin story, which hadn't been told in films before, hadn't really even been addressed in the comics very specifically, actually. Uh, and so we were able to really look at that gap in pop culture and say, okay, what if we try to ground this and really explain how this might happen 
in, in a real world scenario. That was always the jumping off point for the tone of the films. And then the influences on the films were very varied. I mean, we were trying to build a world in the way that you know, Ridley Scott had done in his films like Blade Runner, for example. We were looking at the silent era, you know, Fritz Lang's films and, and so forth, um, trying to figure out the use of the geography of a city to express a sense of metaphor or allegory with the, with the narrative we're creating, which is what the world of Batman and Gotham as a sort of heightened version of, of a regular city, you know, a kind of New York on steroids, if you like. Those were a lot of things feeding into the way in which we approached telling those those three stories or one big story over over three films. And we went into it not knowing that we would get to make three films. We approached Batman Begins very much as an isolated piece, but always with a sense that, okay, if we could, we would return to Gotham, we would try and flesh out you know, a, a bigger story. Because we were interested to see in our telling of Bruce Wayne's story, there was always a finite sense to what he was doing. And that's unusual in the interpretation, but our idea was that it felt that he would need to view this as uh, a character he's created or a symbol he's created to try and inspire the people of Gotham and that there would be an end game to that, that, that he would have an effect on the world and then be able to, to stop. And so we became very interested in seeing how that story would play out. One of the things that's different about my approach to music, the way I use it in my films, is I don't use temp music. Uh, temp music is, you know, when you take existing music, music from other films usually, and when you're editing the film, you put a lot of that in. Uh, then you get a composer on after the fact and say, this is, you know, do this but different. And to me, that always results in cues that are not what you want, because you've put what you want on there and then said, okay, do something different. So by definition, you moving away from what, what first inspired you. So the way I've always worked with composers, like David Julian, um, or James Newton Howard, Hans Zimmer, is to say, okay, let's look at the script, let's talk about the ideas. And then sometimes before we're even shooting or while we're shooting, you know, start sending me ideas, musical ideas, demos based on the narrative concepts, based on just some visual images. I'd tell him it was with hands, you know, I'd send him some stills of what I was doing. Uh, and our approach in every film has been, been different, but the one underlying constant is to try to not ever use temp music, to try and always be working with pieces that have been created specifically for the images that we're, we're shooting and editing. I've been greatly influenced by uh, filmmakers of the past, hugely. Um, I always point to George Lucas's first Star Wars film as a, a seminal influence on, on me. It was the first film that I remember that, that really just opened up the possibilities of, of what you could do with movies. Ridley Scott has always been a tremendous influence on me. I've loved the worlds he's created, the textured quality of those things. Terence Malick is a huge influence and Stanley Kubrick is a filmmaker that I've always greatly admired, although he's one that's difficult to try and imitate or learn too much uh, from specifically, but uh, as an inspiration, just as a great genius of, of cinema. And then more recently, um, specific to Dunkirk, I think, you know, the cinema of Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Clouseau, uh, filmmakers working in the suspense genre were very important to me. I've also been very influenced by silent filmmakers. I go back to the work of Fritz Lang and, and Murnau, and, uh, von Stroheim, uh, those visions, those um, ideas of what movies could do before dialogue came in, before uh, contemporary narrative structures sort of came in. I find going back to those, that older form of storytelling in movies to be very inspiring. I think really the only useful advice I ever got in terms of, you know, trying to figure out your way in to the film business, the film industry, is to get yourself a script and hang on to it. Um, it's that idea, that screenplay, that, that concept, you know, whatever that's going to be, that's so important. And you have to stick to your guns. You have to find something that you can do that maybe other people couldn't do. Uh, and even if that seems different or doesn't fit into people's expectations, 
that's what's going to distinguish it if you can do it successfully. So I think it's really about sticking to your guns and, you know, doing something you passionately believe in rather than uh, trying to appeal to some desire that you imagine other people have for what they want to see in a film. I think you have to be true to your own passion and your own sense of what excites you as a storyteller.